<laughs> so you could say we kind of hit it off from there. Oh, that a boy. <laughs> Tonight I want you to come and I want you to leave here with one thing about me. Wherever I go, no matter who I'm with, no matter what church I'm at, I'm a servant of the Lord. I serve the Lord with a happy heart, with a glad heart in the church and outside the church. That's one thing I am, is a servant. And I will serve wherever I'm at because of the Lord and what he has done for me. And I want you to know that tonight. But the question also extends to you. Are you a servant? After Harriet Tubman escaped from slavery, she returned to the slaveholding state many times to help other slaves escape. She led them safely to the northern free states and to Canada. And that journey to be a runaway slave was very, very dangerous. There were rewards for her capture or for their capture. Ads like you see today to describe the slaves in detail. Whenever Tubman led a group of slaves to freedom, she placed herself in great danger. There was a great bounty offered for her capture because she was a fugitive slave herself. And she was breaking the law in the slave states by helping others escape as well. What do you think Tubman did when someone or if a slave was being frightened or became, became frightened and tried to return, she would tell them, you're either going to be, you're either going to die a free man or you're going to die a slave. Tubman knew that if anyone turned back, it would put her and other escaping slaves in great danger of discovery, capture, or even death. She became so well known for leading slaves to freedom that Tubman became known as Moses of her people. Many slaves dreaming of freedom sang spiritual songs called Go Down Moses. Slaves hoped a Savior would deliver them from slavery just as Moses had to deliver the Israelites from slavery. Tubman made 19 trips to Maryland and helped over 300 people to freedom. During these dangerous journeys, she helped rescue members of her own family, including her 70-year-old parents. At one point, rewards of Tubman's capture totaled at $40,000, which is a lot more now than it is then. Yet, she was never captured, and she never failed to bring her passengers, as she called it, to safety. As Tubman referred to herself, or she said herself, on my Underground Railroad, I never run my train off track. I never lost a passenger. The Underground Railroad was used to bring slaves to freedom. The slaves would go house to house seeking freedom from the South, and they would travel north. The houses that would participate in the Underground Railroad would be the ones who simply put a light on on the front porch, or a lantern, wouldn't be electricity yet. They would go and knock on the door, and the people there would host them, treat them with hospitality, food them, clothe them, and even give them rest. I don't think you realize the cost it was here for the slaves because they could be killed if caught. The slaves sacrifice everything for freedom. The story has a lot to do with us Christians as well. We ourselves are slaves to sin. We are captured, we are enticed. Just like Harriet Tubman was born into slavery. And some of us have searched for years trying to fill an empty void in our lives. But then we found Jesus. The same as Tubman gave up everything for freedom. Even her own family. Same thing for us. We went from slaving to the world in our flesh to being free in Christ. Now the question remains, are you a servant of the Lord Most High? We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Now, I read from the English Standard Version. I know that you guys are used to the King James Version, but I read from the English Standard, which is very closely aligned to the King James. 
We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Romans is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's very enriched in theology. And as we study God's word in Romans, it just it tells us the goodness of Jesus even more. So without further ado, let's stand in honor and reverence, if you're able to, let's stand in honor and reverence to, to God's holy word as it is read. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he appointed, he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who has descended or was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to bring or to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless his holy and mighty word. You may be seated. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I pray as the reading of God's word can prick our hearts to understand his purpose of this passage is to us, Lord. And Father, I pray that we can understand and we can apply it to our lives. Let's, let us open our hearts and our minds. Lord, I pray I step back and let you step forward in my place and let whatever the words you have me speak come from you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. See, the book of Romans is one of my favorite books of the Bible. Like I said earlier, it's so rich in the love that God has for us. But it also is so rich in theology that when we read it, we understand salvation and what God has for us. See, Paul was the author of Romans. He wrote this book purposefully for the different churches in Rome because they were experiencing persecution in all different directions. They were experiencing persecution from the Jews, from the Gentiles. They were experiencing persecution from different leaders, the Roman government. And see, Paul wanted to reassure them of who they are in Christ, but also they were experiencing persecution from false teachers. And we still have false teachers today that come into the churches and try to drive away the people of God into what they want them to do. That's exactly what Paul was writing. His purpose was to inform them of a gospel because of it. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted to enlighten them. He wanted to persuade them that Jesus Christ is the only way. And so we see in the text, Paul identifies himself in three different ways. The first way is servant. Now see, in some different translations, the word servant is translated to slave, bond servant. But it all translates and means the same thing, servant. This word can be defined as someone who was forced to stay with their master's and the only way to escape was by death. More times than not, they were born into that status. They had family that was already a servant or already in slavery, and they had to stay in that. And so Paul, he had no reserve when he referred to himself as a slave. When I refer to myself as a child of God, I have absolutely no regret to say that I am a follower of Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we all in this world have to have that mindset. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. No one's going to persuade me. No one's going to move me into a different direction. And that is exactly how Paul was. Paul, he identified himself straight away as a man who serves the living God. He was a servant. He was a slave to the Lord. Now, to the Greeks, this was a very foreign, weird word. The reason being is because this was a very demeaning to say that you are a servant because of the way or the environment that servants lived under. Paul wanted his readers to know that he is not ashamed. He has no reserves, no regret of any kind to be called a believer. 
to be called a follower of Jesus. The next thing that he refers to himself as apostle of the Lord. The word apostle means messenger. It means that he is one to bring the message of the gospel to the people in Rome. And the only way that he could possibly do it was through writing the book of Romans, through writing his letters. He wanted to inform them. He wanted to encourage them once again. Everything that Paul went through in, in the life was used to prepare him for what God had ahead of him. And so sometimes in our life, we go through difficult situations because God is using those storms of our lives to prepare us for what's ahead in our life. And that's exactly what he did for Paul. Paul, before he became Paul, he was Saul. And Saul, I don't know if you know, but he went around killing numerous amounts of Christians. He, his goal was to put away Christianity, was to smother it, was to illiterate it. I'm sorry, I used that word wrong. He wanted to destroy it. <laughs> Obliviate. Sure. There you go, obliviate. But he wanted to get rid of it. He wanted to do away with it. But God revealed himself on the road to Damascus, and he asked one simple question, which meant for a life transformation. Why are you persecuting me? And from then on, his life was completely different. Everything he went through. Paul did not choose what God had in store for him. God had chosen what he wanted for his life, what he had in store for him. He was set apart. He was set apart from, from day one. Some say this refers to only when he received Jesus, but some say that this also, or this only refers to when he was born. I think he was set apart when he was born. Because in Jeremiah, it says that before you were born, I formed you in the womb. I believe God had a, has a purpose for each and every one of us here today, and he has a purpose for those who are not even born yet. Yeah. Yeah. Now, all these things were used to identify Paul, but you must see that it was used to give all the glory and honor and praise to God. He didn't want nothing, no praise, no reverence to himself. He wanted to give everything he had in honor and praise to the Lord. And see, then in verse 2 through 4, Jesus is identified and predicted all throughout Scripture. If you look in verse 2 with me, it says, Which he promised beforehand, he being God, which he promised beforehand through the, his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. One of my favorite songs outlines each and every individual book in the Bible and talks about how Jesus is present in every book of the Bible. Listen with me. In Genesis, he is the breath of life. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is our high priest. Numbers, the fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is Moses' voice. In Joshua, he is salvation's choice. In Judges, he is the lawgiver. In Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is sovereign. Ezra, the true and faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of broken walls and lives. In Esther, he's Mordecai's courage. In Job, the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, he is our morning song. In Proverbs, he is the wisdom's cry. In Ecclesiastes, the time and season. In Song of Solomon, he is the lover's dream. In Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he is the weeping prophet. And Lamentation is the cry of Israel. And Ezekiel, he is the call from sin. And Daniel, the stranger in the fire. And Hosea, he is forever faithful. And Joel, he is the spirit's power. And Amos, the arms that carry us. And Obadiah, he is the Lord, our Savior. Amen? Amen. And Jonah, he is the great missionary. And Micah, the promise of peace. And Nahum, he is our strength and our shield. And Habakkuk and Sethaniah, he's pleading for an idol. In Haggai, he restores a lost heritage. And Zechariah, our fountain. And Malachi, he is the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is God, man, Messiah. 
In the book of Acts, he is fire from heaven. In Romans, he is the grace of God. In Corinthians, the power of love. In Galatians, he is freedom from a curse of sin. In Ephesians, our glorious treasure. Philippians, the servant's heart. In Colossians, he is the Godhead Trinity. Thessalonians, our coming king. In Timothy, Titus, Philemon. He is our mediator and our faithful pastor. In Hebrews, the everlasting covenant. In James, the one who heals the sick. In first and second Peter, he is our shepherd. In John and in Jude, he is the lover coming for his bride. In Revelation, he is the king of kings and the Lord Amen. of lords. Amen. All throughout scripture, Jesus is proclaimed to be who he right. is. When he died on the cross, all of those different things, prophecies in the Old Testament had been foretold and had been completed. Jesus right. is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He has been proclaimed and he is still being proclaimed to this day. Jesus came from the line of David on his mother's side. You can see that from Adam and Eve's prediction in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And you can also see in Matthew's genealogy when he's talking about the, the life of Jesus and all the way back to the beginning. He has declared the Son of God when the resurrection took place. And I call verses 5 through 6 the cause and effect. Look at me at 5 and 6. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. The cause and effect. We gain apostleship and grace through Jesus. Apostleship, which means the ability to share his message and grace, giving us things beyond what we, what we need and what we deserve. He gives us things. I'm a messenger, and you are a messenger because of Jesus. Because I have received Jesus, I get grace. Amen. Grace means the unmerited favor of God. Gives us things like forgiveness, love, and mercy, and many more things. Grace is extended to everyone. Don't matter who you are, that is extended to everyone. But because I have these things, because I am a follower of Jesus, I get these things. Because I'm a follower of Jesus. If I wasn't a follower of Jesus, I wasn't able to get those gifts. But because Paul says specifically, you get these because you are a follower of Jesus. To bring about the obedience of faith for his name's sake. It's not for me. It's not for anybody else. But because of the faith, you are obedient through him because of his name's sake. Not for yourself. Because I have Jesus, it is my responsibility to share, to be obedient. Because I have Jesus, it is my responsibility to be his messenger. And see, Paul ends this little section, this little greeting, by wishing peace among the people in Rome. And I will do the same with you. Now, Paul wants his readers to understand that his testimony both starts and ends with Jesus. That's right. It's all because of Jesus he began his ministry. He was established by God and now wants them to do the same. And in the 21st century, God wants us today, here tonight, to have that same understanding. So the first thing is, you must identify your life with Jesus. You must be a servant of Jesus. Now, Paul identified himself as three things, and we must do the same. We must identify ourselves as servants, as apostles, and as set apart for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to identify as a servant, a servant of the Lord of the living God. We are born into slaves to sin, but Christ, we are free. We are born as slaves to sin, but with Christ, we are free. And all throughout the book of Romans, Paul explains that in great detail, that we are slaves to sin, but through Christ, we are set free. One of my favorite movies is Batman. Now, which one? Just kidding. I have to explain this in a way hopefully you'll understand. But not the newest Batman. But not Batman Begins, but not the old one. It's the in-between. Uh, Jim Carrey plays on one of those movies. It's, it's the, aligned with those movies. 
But you see, in every single Batman movie, we have a butler. His name is Alfred. Even on the VeggieTale of Larry Boy version, there's a Alfred in that movie, too. I just thought about that. But anyway, but in every single movie of Batman, Alfred is so faithful to Batman. Why is that? Because of his love for him. See, Alfred, he watched Batman grow up. He watched him grow into the man that he was. He encouraged him, and he loved him. So maybe it is here today that we should be like Alfred, not have, not seek for Batman, but seek out the Lord in that manner. Have a love for Jesus in that manner to the point where we are able and we are willing to do whatever Jesus asks us to do. One of my favorite songs is that we are no longer slaves to fear, but I am a child of the living God. The next thing, he identifies us, or we should identify with him as an apostle, which means messenger. We have the responsibility given by God to be his messenger, to be his messenger of the gospel, to go into the ends of the world to be his messenger. Now, the ends of the world can mean the end of this road. Go into Arbondale to try to see souls saved. That is our responsibility given to us as Paul wants us to identify as a, an apostle. Now, Paul Revere, I trust everybody knows who Paul Revere is. Mm -hmm. He was a messenger for the colonies. His prime objective was to warn the army that the British were coming. Now, I can just picture Paul Revere on this hill, and he sees the British coming, and he's over here yelling as he slaps his horse to get going. And he begins to yell, the British are coming, the British are coming. We need to have that same mindset as Christians to the lost, that Jesus is coming soon, and we need to repent. Noah had that same message. Repent or perish to the people that he was laughed at. John the Baptist, who was also a messenger, brought the message of repentance. Repent or perish. You see, Paul Revere, he could have chosen, oh, well, I guess I won't do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm just too lazy. He could have provided many excuses in the book. But he chose to do it anyway. Just like the other three gentlemen. I mean, two. Noah and John the Baptist. They could have been lazy and decided to be disobedient rather than obedient to the Lord. We have a message that is more than willing to go to the end of the world. And we shouldn't have to have a reason for it to go other than there's no reason. Paul identifies himself as set apart, the same thing we should identify as. The only way for people to see Christ is in us if we are set apart. John says the people will know that we are disciples if we love. You see, love is the only way people see us being set apart from the world. Having an unquenched, unconditional, unwavering love for people, regardless of who they are, that's going to show the love of God. Now, love doesn't mean acceptance. Love means being willing to share the good news of God, even when it's hard. The last thing is we must surrender. So Paul uses the words, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. See, we love to fight. We love to fight Jesus. We love to give excuses. My dad, every time I told him I didn't want to go to church, he would always sing the song, excuses, excuses. You hear them every day. I'm like, okay, dad, I'll go to church. Right. 
But we love to fight God. We love to spew out excuses every chance we get. And I'm just as guilty, if not more guilty, than anybody. But Paul says we must surrender. Because we belong to Jesus Christ. And to give ourselves, to give up ourselves, means we must have no control. Having no control, meaning, all right, God, I'm pursuing you and only you. My mind is totally and fully on you and who you are. So in slavery, the reason why people were so hesitant to leave is because slavery was all they know. It's all they ever knew. Do you think that the slaves back during the Civil War, even though they wanted to taste freedom, they didn't know what it was going to be like because they were comfortable where they were? Maybe it's like a loss. They don't know what a life in Jesus is, but they do know what their life is now, and they're way more comfortable now than they were, than they will be. Maybe that's a reason. I don't know. Because slavery and slaves, they had to leave their families behind, their friends, the people they grew up with, everything. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie God's Not Dead, but one of my favorite scenes in that movie and is probably the most heartfelt scene in the whole movie. But there is a Muslim on there who gave her life to Christ and her dad kicked her out of her home because she gave up her life for Christ, because she surrendered her life to Christ. Her whole life was gone. Everything. Her family. Her home, everything. But God blessed her for it. Luke writes this, that Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross daily. The rich young ruler was told to give up everything to follow him, and he walked away sad because he couldn't do it. And Paul says to the church in Corinth that we, met, we must let the love of God Compel us. Compel is a fancy word for control. Yeah. To move us into different places in our lives. It's also a fancy way of saying, let everything you do be out of the love of Jesus Christ. So we belong to Jesus because he bought us with his blood. The next thing is, we must be obedient. Because I have Jesus, I will tell others about him. Because I have Jesus, I will have the faith. Because I have Jesus, I will do what he says. We must be obedient. So, three points. We must identify ourselves as Paul identified him as. Apostle. Set apart. And a servant. And we must surrender. And we must be obedient. So this evening, it is a simple question that I'm asking you. Are you a servant? I opened up with a testimony of myself that wherever I go, whoever I'm with, I am a servant and I serve people with that mindset. That I am a servant of the Lord. I am a servant of the Son of the living God. I am a servant of Jesus. The question extends to you. Are you a servant? It is really that simple. In Christianity, we often overcompensate ourselves. We often overcomplicate everything. Oh, God's got me. I can do whatever I want. I can go off and live the life I want to live and be done with it. But God says you must be obedient. You must surrender. Okay, I'm doing this for the Lord. But what's in it for me? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that we have such a what's in it for me attitude with everything, including myself? Sometimes, anyway. Sometimes more times than not. But you know, historically, just a little side note, I don't mean to chase the rabbit, but it has to do with this. 
But did you know historically that in the biblical times, the whole family stayed in one house, one room, and slept on the floor? Gosh, that must have stank at times. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the close bond between the family members that, you, that they had, they probably had this unbreakable relationship with one another. But now some families just can't stop fighting. And it's because it's all about me. It's about ourselves. What's in it for me? We look at that in Christianity. But the Lord says, you need to surrender. You need to identify yourselves in Christ. Are you a servant this evening? And if not, maybe you need to come forward and rededicate your life. Because Christ is asking you that today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love and mercy. But Father, I pray with all my heart that if there's someone here this evening that doesn't know you, will come forth. And Lord, I pray with all my heart that if there's somebody here that, that understands that they're not a servant, Lord, I pray they can come rededicate their life. And Father, I pray that as we go into this place that we can be changed and renewed to have a mindset of a servant. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.